Welcome to the Foundational Sexual Health presentation offered on behalf of the Student Life Student Wellness Center. During this presentation, you can expect to learn more about your own sexual health, safer sex practices, and local sexual health resources in the Columbus, Ohio area. This presentation is designed for students who've received little to no comprehensive sexual health education in their K-12 schooling. Before we get started, I'd like to tell you more about the Student Life Student Wellness Center at The Ohio State University. We support all Ohio State students as they work to live happier and healthier lives. We promote balanced lifestyles and student success through the nine dimensions of wellness. Please visit our website at swc.osu.edu to learn more about our various programs and services listed on this slide. The center has physical locations across the Columbus campus with the main suite housed in the RPAC. Additional satellite locations include the PAES building, Baker Hall, Lincoln Tower, and St. Stephen's Church. Typical operating hours are Monday through Thursday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., and on Fridays from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Let's briefly review the intended learning outcomes for today's presentation. Participants listening in will be able to, one, define basic sexual and reproductive anatomy in the sexual response cycle. Two, identify safer sex practices, including risk reduction strategies and contraceptive methods and three, increase their knowledge regarding sexual health preventive care and local resources both on campus and in the community. Our first section today will focus on sexual health basics, namely reproductive anatomy and the sexual response cycle. Let's begin with basic female reproductive anatomy. It is important to mention that this anatomy depicts someone whose biological sex is female, and this does not necessarily reflect their gender identity. The image on the left depicts external female genitalia, known as the vulva, while the image on the right shows internal female reproductive anatomy. Also to note, this medical illustration has little pubic hair, which is not natural. Looking at the female external genitalia, we can see the following features. The clitoris, labia, vagina, urethra, and anus. The clitoris is a small bump of protruding tissue covered with a thin flap of tissue, the clitoral hood. It is the main source of sexual sensation and pleasure during sexual activity. The fleshy lips, or labia majora and labia minora, are located on either side of the vagina and are meant to protect the vagina from injury or debris. The opening of the vagina, also called the birth canal, is part of the internal reproductive tract and extends from the uterus to the outside of the body. You can also see the urethra, the tubular opening that leads to the bladder for urination, and the anus, the opening that leads to the colon for defecation. Now turning our attention to the internal anatomy, we can see the following features, the vagina, cervix, uterus, fallopian tubes, and ovaries. The female reproductive tract includes two ovaries, which produce the female's egg cells. At certain intervals, an ovary will release a mature egg, which passes through the fallopian tube into the uterus. The fallopian tube is the intended location for conception to occur. That is to say, a sperm successfully fertilizes an egg. If everything goes accordingly, the fertilized egg will then implant itself into the wall of the uterus, where the fetus will develop over the course of the pregnancy. If conception does not take place, the person may shed the lining of the uterus, known as the endometrium, through the cervix and vaginal opening on a monthly basis during their period. This time is called menstruation. In terms of contraception, intrauterine devices, or IUDs, are placed inside of the uterus, while diaphragms and female condoms are placed inside of the vagina to prevent pregnancy. We will now transition to the male reproductive anatomy. It is again important to mention that this anatomy depicts someone whose biological sex is male, and this does not necessarily reflect their gender identity. The image on the left depicts external male genitalia, while the image on the right shows internal male reproductive anatomy. This medical illustration also has very little pubic hair, which is not natural. Looking at the external male genitalia, we can see the following features, the penis, urethra, and scrotum. The penis serves both a sexual function, which is to ejaculate semen, and a physical function, which is to allow urine to exit through the urethra. The head of the penis, or glands, is covered at birth by the foreskin, a retractable roll of skin. The urethra transports urine from the bladder out of the body. 
Semen will also travel through the urethra from its original source in the testes. The scrotum is a pouch of skin which contains the two testes where sperm is made, matured, and stored until ejaculation. It is important to mention that males can be circumcised, meaning the foreskin is removed from the glands or head of the penis by surgery typically performed at birth or shortly thereafter. In the United States, 81% of males ages 14 to 59 are circumcised, while most of the males in the world are not. Now, turning our attention to the internal anatomy, we can see the following features. The testes, epididymis, vas deferens, seminal vesicle, prostate gland, an ejaculatory duct. Sperm, the male equivalent to a female's egg cells, is produced in the testes and stored to mature in the epididymis. When a male is ready to ejaculate, either through sexual intercourse or masturbation, the sperm travels through the tubular vas deferens towards the urethra where it becomes semen. This transformation from sperm to semen is accomplished with the help of the seminal vesicle and prostate gland secretions that include several proteins and enzymes meant to keep the sperm protected and well-nourished. The ejaculatory duct helps discharge semen through the urethra and alternates its function with the bladder when urinating. This is an involuntary function, meaning that the male cannot control the duct itself. This explains why some people may find it difficult to urinate after ejaculation. It is entirely normal and should not cause concern. Are you familiar with the sexual response cycle? This topic is one that is commonly overlooked in traditional sexual health courses in middle and high school. The cycle refers to a sequence of physical and behavioral changes that occur as a person is sexually aroused, which may result from sexual contact or intercourse and during masturbation. It is named after two well-known sex researchers, William Masters and Virginia Johnson, who conducted extensive research in the 1960s. There are four distinct physiological phases experienced by people in this model. Excitement, plateau, orgasm, and resolution. The intensity of each response and time spent in each phase varies from person to person. Therefore, open and frequent communication among sexual partners is important as it is unlikely that everyone will experience a satisfying climax from every sexual encounter. Understanding the differences among partners' sexual responses can improve the quality of sex generally. We won't go into detail today about each of these four phases, but I encourage you to learn more about the sexual response cycle online. It is also helpful to know that the model itself has many limitations, but is still the most commonly taught model in health classes. Some of those limitations include the linear nature of the reported phases the fact that only heterosexual couples were studied in the research, and that the model does not greatly detail important relationship concepts, including desire and intimacy. Our second section today will focus on safer sex practices, namely the range of normal sexual behavior and risk reduction strategies, which will include an overview of contraceptive and barrier methods. To begin, Humans express their sexuality through a variety of acts, ranging from those done alone to acts with others, with varying degrees of sexual contact with or without penetration. When we talk about reducing your risk, typically we mean preventing sexually transmitted infections or STIs or unintended pregnancy. Risk-free ways to give and receive sexual pleasure include masturbating, sexting, phone sex, and dry humping, also known as grinding or outer course. Low to moderate risk activities include kissing, intimate massage, sex toy play, and genital touching. All forms of penetrative sex are considered high risk. This may include oral, vaginal, vaginal and anal sex. This slide also includes the terms fetish, kink, and BDSM. To clarify, kink is a term that describes a broad range of alternative sexual interests or preferences that go beyond what is considered normal sexual behavior. A fetish is a type of kink, that is to say, a sexual fixation on a specific object or act that is needed for sexual gratification. BDSM is an acronym that stands for bondage, domination, sadism, and masochism. This is any sexual activity that involves practices such as the use of physical restraints, granting and relinquishing of control, and the inf infliction of pain that places emphasis on consent among all involved partners. 
It is important to mention that you can always choose to practice abstinence. Some people define abstinence in different ways based on their own beliefs. From a healthcare perspective, abstinence means avoiding any kind of sexual activity that can lead to STI contraction or pregnancy. Therefore, this means no vaginal, oral, or anal sex and no touching of the genitals. Safe sex is all about reducing your risk of unintended pregnancy and STI transmission. Here are a few important ways that you can reduce your risk. Remember, it is very important that you engage in open and honest communication with your partners to make sure you're all staying safe. One, talk with your partners about STIs, sexual health, and prevention before sexual activity. Having this conversation beforehand is especially important as it can be difficult to do in the heat of the moment and will likely be less effective if you choose to talk about it afterwards. Two, use a latex condom or other barrier method to reduce STI transmission in addition to a hormonal birth control to prevent unintended pregnancy and use lubricant generously. Using a barrier method in addition to a hormonal method is referred to as a dual method of protection and will offer you the greatest protection possible. Lubricant is especially important from not only a pleasure standpoint, from also from a risk reduction standpoint, as it reduces the likelihood of irritation, friction, and tearing of any skin or membranes. Three, get immunized to protect against certain STIs, including hepatitis A, B, and HPV. The HPV vaccine is now recommended for people regardless of their biological sex and can be given well into adulthood. Four, know your partner's HIV STI status and limit your number of partners, especially anonymous ones. It is important to have the conversation before initiating sexual contact and if possible, encourage your partner to get tested together. With an anonymous partner, it can become more difficult to know their sexual health and history and also contact them in the event of a positive STI test result. Five, Avoid risky sex practices, such as unprotected intercourse and sharing sex toys without a barrier method. These behaviors are considered the riskiest because they increase exposure to bodily fluids that may transmit disease, such as semen, blood, and vaginal secretions. Six, get regular HIV STI testing if sexually active, which means every three to six months between sexual partners or if your current sexual partner tests positive for an STI. Seven, don't share needles if injecting drugs. Be sure to use clean and sanitized equipment. There is a clear link between intravenous drug use and greater risk of bloodborne diseases, including HIV and hepatitis C. Needles may also be contaminated when used for tattoos or body piercings, so the same guidance applies. Eight, practice mutual monogamy or polyamory and abstinence if desired. To be clear, monogamy refers to having a relationship or sex with only one partner, while polyamory refers to involvement in multiple relationships or sexual contact with numerous people. Someone who is in a polyamorous relationship should still use all of the aforementioned guidance to reduce their risk. There are many forms of contraception available today. We can divide them into three main categories. One, hormonal methods that only prevent pregnancy, of which there are short and long acting versions, two, barrier methods that prevent both STI transmission and pregnancy, and three, emergency contraception that's intended to be taken following an instance of unprotected intercourse. Let's begin with short-acting hormonal methods. These methods introduced hormones, typically a combination of estrogen and progesterone, into the bloodstream, stopping ovulation as well as thickening cervical mucus, making it harder for sperm to penetrate and fertilize an egg. As mentioned, hormonal methods are only effective against pregnancy, and these short-acting forms last for one to three months worth of continuous protection. The first type of short-acting hormonal method is an oral contraceptive, commonly known as the pill. A pill is taken orally by the user each day. Most formulations include three weeks of active pills and one week of placebo pills, during which time the user will have their period, or menses. The vaginal ring. This is a small, flexible piece of plastic inserted into the vagina by the user to deliver hormones into the bloodstream. It must be replaced on a monthly basis in order to function as intended. The transdermal patch. This form is a medicated adhesive patch placed on the skin by the user to deliver hormones into the bloodstream. It must be replaced on a weekly basis in order to function as intended. 
the hormonal shot. The shot refers to an injection of hormones administered by a medical provider every three months. It is crucial that the user schedules these appointments in a timely fashion, as waiting too long after the three month mark will jeopardize the shot's efficacy. Long acting hormonal methods work in a similar fashion as the short acting methods, but for a longer term of effective use. They're still only effective against pregnancy and last for three to 10 years worth of continuous protection. The intrauterine device or IUD is a small T-shaped plastic piece inserted into the uterus by a medical provider. Hormonal forms have an approved range of three to five years of effective use, while the non-hormonal form, the copper IUD, is approved for 10 years of effective use. Additionally, the copper IUD can also be used as a form of emergency contraception if inserted up to five days after unprotected sex. The contraceptive implant. The implant is a small matchstick shaped piece of plastic inserted under the skin into the upper arm by a medical provider. It is approved for three years of effective use. Next, let's review barrier methods, which create a physical barrier between egg and sperm and between exposed skin and membranes. Importantly, they must be used during each sex act to be effective. That is to say, they cannot be reused and must be thrown away after initial use. Male or external and female or internal condoms. Condoms are effective against both pregnancy and STI transmission. Male condoms are placed over the erect head and shaft of the penis, while female condoms are inserted into the vagina and sit up against the cervix. They are frequently made of latex, but alternatives include lambskin and polyurethane for people with latex allergies. Additionally, female or internal condoms can also be used for anal sex if the inner ring is removed before insertion. The dental dam. This method refers to a latex sheath that is placed over the genitals during oral sex. It can be flavored or lubricated, and as an inexpensive alternative, can also be made out of a male condom cut lengthwise. The finger cot. This method refers to a miniature male-like condom used to cover the finger with a latex sheath that can protect skin against cuts or blood on the hand or body. The latex glove. This method provides additional protection to the hand and skin and is a more extensive alternative to a finger cot. Our third and final category is emergency contraception, also known as EC. Typically, EC is effective for three to five days after unprotected sex, with the understanding that the sooner you take it, the greater its efficacy. EC is not the same as the medical abortion pill, meaning that if you're already pregnant, it will not terminate an existing pregnancy. All forms are available over the counter, except for Ella, which requires a prescription from a medical provider. ELLA is formulated for individuals with a higher body mass index, or BMI, of 25 to 30. When it comes to contraception, it is important that you discuss your options with your partners and medical provider and choose an option that is best for your lifestyle and medical needs. Be sure to practice your method correctly and consistently every time, and consider a dual method by combining a hormonal and barrier method to strengthen your overall protection and reduce your risk. As mentioned, barrier methods work by preventing direct contact with skin and any exchange of bodily fluids, semen, blood, or vaginal secretions for all people involved in sexual activity. They are the only type of contraception that protects against STI transmission as well as pregnancy. While still prone to potential failure, these methods are highly effective when used correctly and consistently every time. It is important to use a barrier method for all kinds of sex, which includes oral, anal, vaginal, and digital sex. Digital sex refers to stimulation to the genitals using one's hands or fingers. Please remember to combine the barrier method with a water or silicone-based lubricant to make it safer and feel better too. These types of lubricant can be purchased online or at the pharmacy where they're commonly found in the family planning aisle. It is important that barrier methods are not used with oil-based lubricants such as baby oil, coconut oil, and many lotions, as the lubricant will degrade the latex and cause the method to rip or tear. It is also generally advised that spermicide, which may be added to condoms or sold on its own, be avoided as it can cause genital infections and irritation to the vulva. For that same reason, any food products that may be enticing in the bedroom, including whipped cream, honey, or chocolate syrup, should also be avoided or kept to activity at the waist up. Our third section today will focus on sexual health preventive care 
including important questions to ask yourself and your healthcare providers. The first thing you should consider once you turn 18 years old or become sexually active is to start regular sexual health checkups. It is important that you find a provider with whom you feel comfortable and talk openly and honestly with them about your sexual health. Feel empowered to ask any personal questions you may have regarding your well-being. When it comes to the type of medical professional you should be seeing, you may decide to see your primary care provider in internal or family medicine, or you may see a specialist, such as an obstetrician and gynecologist, urologist, or women's health nurse practitioner. The Wills Student Health Center on campus also offers sexual health care, but it is important to note that you must have private or student health insurance to access these services. Once you have established care, find out the specific services you need, which may include contraceptive counseling, pregnancy testing and emergency contraception, STI or HIV testing, cervical cancer screening, also known as a pap test, which is given every three years starting at age 21, clinical breast and pelvic exam, HPV vaccination, sexual violence services, or testing for non-consensual drugging, commonly called date rape, pre- and post-exposure prophylaxis for HIV, also known as PrEP and PEP, and pregnancy counseling and referrals. Another aspect of good preventive care is making sure that all sexual health vaccinations are up to date. The HPV vaccine, known as Gardasil, is recommended for everyone, regardless of sex, and protects against certain cancers caused by the human papilloma virus. It can now be given up to age 45, regardless of sexual or pap test history. The HPV vaccine is given as a three-dose series for those ages 15 to 26 and is typically covered by health insurance. It is available at the Will Student Health Center through a monthly vaccine clinic. Vaccinations against hepatitis A or B may also be recommended based on your sexual history and risk. Currently, a vaccine for hepatitis C does not exist. Lastly, performing sexual health self-exams of the breast tissue and testicles is recommended for increased self-awareness. These exams should occur once a month in the shower with soap and then again in front of a mirror. For females, it is important to do it around the same time each month, ideally several days after your period when breasts are least likely to be swollen or tender. Examine breast tissue and testicles closely for shape, size, and texture using soap and water to reduce friction and make the process easier. Make note of any changes and seek medical care for any lumps, bumps, or irregularities. People often wonder if they are at high risk of contracting an STI once they become sexually active. If you answer yes to any of the questions on this slide, routine preventive care is extremely important for you. These are the questions that you need to consider. Have you had unprotected vaginal, anal, or oral sex, which would mean sex without a condom or other barrier method? Do you currently have multiple or anonymous sex partners? Do you currently have an STI, including HIV? Have you shared injection drug equipment, including needles or syringes? Do you exchange sex for drugs or money? Do you have a sex partner who answers yes to any of these questions or whose health status you don't know? Even if you didn't answer yes to any of these questions, annual sexual health exams are important starting at age 18 or whenever you first become sexually active. If you never had a sexual health checkup before, take time to consider what questions you may like to ask your medical provider in advance. Before making any medical appointment, be sure to ask about accepted forms of health insurance or if proof of insurance is even required. When it comes to screening and testing, you may wish to ask, what tests should I be getting and how are they done? Or how often should I be tested and how can I protect myself? On the topic of contraceptives, it may be helpful to ask, what are the best options for me? What are the side effects? Partner issues is another topic for which a medical provider may be able to help. These questions could include, what if my partner doesn't want to use protection? How do I tell my partner if I test positive for an STI? And my partner wants to have sex more often than I do, what should I say? Lastly, the topic of sexual functioning and performance is also a common concern and one that is entirely appropriate to bring up with your provider. Many people may ask about discomfort or pain with sex or noticeable changes in their sex drive. 
Our fourth and final section today will provide a brief overview of some important sexual health resources here in the Columbus community. Within the Student Life Student Wellness Center, we offer student membership in the Condom Club to save money on various barrier methods, as well as free walk-in HIV STI testing offered in two convenient locations on campus during the autumn and spring semesters. As a member of the Condom Club, you can purchase up to 25 barrier methods for $5 Buck ID cash per day. The purchase also includes two free packets of lubricant. Becoming a member is simple. First, view a short educational video and take a five question quiz. You must get four out of the five questions right to pass and become a member. Two, pay using your Buck ID. Regardless of the number of condoms or barriers purchased, the total upfront cost is $5. Buck ID cash is the only form of payment accepted. Your $5 purchase earns you 25 purchasing points. Third, with your points, select your condoms and other barrier methods from the menu provided on our website and at the RPAC location. Free walk-in HIV STI testing is offered five nights a week on campus, Monday and Tuesday evenings from 4.30 to 8.30 p.m. in the Multicultural Center located within the Ohio Union, Wednesday and Thursday evening from 4.30 to 8.30 p.m. in the Student Wellness Center Suite B130 within the RPAC, and on Friday afternoons from 1 to 5 p.m. in the Student Wellness Center space. Free testing is offered for chlamydia, gonorrhea, HIV, and syphilis, and may require a urine and or blood sample. Testing is administered by trained student test counselors and phlebotomists from Equitas Health, a local nonprofit healthcare organization. To learn more about these services, visit our website at swc.osu.edu. The Student Life Student Health Services housed in the Will Student Health Center offers gynecologic care as well as men's health services. The building is located near the RPAC next to the Thompson Library. The WILS does require proof of insurance to access its services. Gynecologic services available include annual preventive health exams, breast exams, pap smears and routine pelvic exams, pregnancy testing and referrals, screening, diagnosis and treatment of STIs and vaginitis, abnormal pap follow-up, colposcopy and cryosurgery, contraceptive counseling, prescription and management, and emergency contraception at a significant discount. Student Health Services also offers the HPV vaccine clinic on various days of the month. For more information, visit their website at shs.osu.edu. Columbus Public Health, located at 204 Parsons Avenue, is home to the Sexual Health Clinic and Take Care Down There Clinic. These clinics do not require proof of health insurance and offer services for free or at a reduced cost based on income. The Sexual Health Clinic is a walk-in HIV STI testing clinic operating on a sliding fee scale, meaning that no one is turned away for inability to pay, and offers diagnosis and treatment for the following STIs, HIV, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, herpes, and trichomoniasis. The Take Care Down There Clinic is a free walk-in STI clinic that offers testing for the following STIs, chlamydia, gonorrhea, trichomoniasis, and syphilis. All test results take five to seven business days to process. This clinic does not provide STI treatment or physical exams. If you are experiencing symptoms, you should visit the sexual health clinic. Learn more by visiting their website at columbus.gov slash public health. Equitas Health is a nonprofit healthcare organization that has locations across the state of Ohio. For most Ohio State students, the locations in Clintonville at 440 North High Street and the Short North at 1033 North High Street are most convenient. Equitas Health Clinics offer discounted services to patients who are uninsured or meet certain income thresholds. Equitas Health provides confidential HIV and STI testing and treatment, as well as transgender health care, HIV care, and PrEP and PEP counseling and cost navigation. Depending on the clinic location, they can test for the following STIs, HIV, hepatitis C, chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. Equitas Health is also home to SafePoint, a harm reduction program offering needle exchange, overdose prevention education, HIV, STI, and hepatitis C testing, 
and referrals to addiction treatment. Equitas also coordinates Mosaic, a wellness program and community space for transgender, non-binary, gender non-conforming people of color ages 13 to 24. To learn more about these services, visit their website at equitashealth.com. This concludes our foundational sexual health presentation. If you'd like to learn more about today's topic or more about the Student Life Student Wellness Center, please visit our website at swc.osu.edu. Thanks for listening.